welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, where we discuss e-commerce issues and whether our guest today automated, delegated, or eliminated them and why. Your host is Will Christensen, co-founder of Data Automation. And again, welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. I'm your host, Will Christensen. This podcast is sponsored and published by Data Automation. I am so excited today for our guest. This is a a gentleman that I met in my journeys through the SaaS forest, so to speak, the different opportunities that are out there in terms of the people. And and I'm so impressed by the software that I have, that that I've seen and used and and had. I've actually been an end user. I've I've been on the, I've received usage as a a user on there as well. So I'm super excited about that like to welcome Matt Barnett to the show, originally a British industrial designer and artist. Matt turned everything upside down to launch a tech company in Sydney, Australia. Matt's love of building great products is only surpassed by his total commitment to building a great business culture. Matt asserts that Bonjoro's customers as friends is the culture. That, that's, that's what it's about. It's been the main driver of business success. His goal is to be the next Zappos to be the most loved brand in the world. And if you haven't seen it yet, the videos of Matt dressed up just like a teddy bear and his mentality of becoming a brand that people love is really, really powerful. So welcome to the show, Matt. We're excited to have you here. Hey, well, thanks for having me along. So as many of you who have listened to, to prior episodes about uh, what we're doing in this second season of Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, we are bringing on founders and we're, we're trying to understand what automation, delegation, or elimination they brought to the world in their SaaS software. So, you know, super excited to hear a little bit about where Matt's vision was and, and why he got where. But let's start with what does your software do, uh, Matt? Let's start there. Yeah, so we're a one-to-one video messaging system. Uh, so we plug in as a layer. If you use a CRM or, or um, email system like MailChimp, Intercom, Active Campaign, Patreon, Shopify, like you, like you name it, um, any way you deal with customers, we'll plug in and we'll suggest certain points on the customer journey when it's actually very valuable to send a personalized video to a customer or lead in order to either convert them um, to activate them or to get them to drive a referral or a testimonial. And when I say a personalized message, what I mean is you will come in the morning once you set up an automation and decide where in the funnel this makes sense. That will give you a list of, let's say, leads with their full names, where they're from, what they do, what they've done in your software so far. And you'll be recording a 30 second video for each and every one of those. So if Joanne from um, Kansas signs up with Bitly, you'll be doing a video saying, hey, Joanne, so we signed up with Bitly from uh, from wherever you are. Um, just want to say welcome on board. By the way, I can see you've done X, Y, and Z. Here's my suggestion for the next steps to get the most out of, out of our business. And so 30 second video, um, huge impact for users. And it's mostly not really about even the video. It's about taking 30 seconds out of your day to recognize and celebrate customers and leads. That's it. So I love that. So so the idea is creating, and it's actually interesting that you talk about that because before I heard about your, your software, I actually was using, like I would do a, like a Loom video and, and I'll, I'd send that off uh, every once in a while. Tamsin actually helps me with some of our LinkedIn outreach um, where we connect with more people. And I, I specifically recorded a somewhat generic, less personalized video that we use in that sequence. That is so powerful. Okay. So you've got to tell me, I mean, what makes you different from the Looms or the Screencastifies or, I mean, I don't even consider those competitors necessarily because obviously they're not automating the process of giving you that prompt and doing those things. What sets you apart from your competition and what makes you different from something like a Loom or a Screencastify? It's about personalization. It's about doing it as part of your workflow. So if anything, we're actually wanting more of a workflow tool. They said, look, videos, video is an amazing medium. I wouldn't say we're a video company. Uh, we just happen to give you that as one of our tools. Uh, and we've been doing other tools around this. But essentially, it's it's more building funnels and working out where on the customer journey, things like a bit of personalization will increase your chances of, of say, converting those leads or of driving, you know, a new sign up to actually activate on the software or on the course that so they hang around and don't churn. So driving those actions and then monitoring those as well. So measuring the results of those. Um, it's built more for teams. So instance, yeah, if you're in software, it'll be your CS team. 
if you're e-commerce it'll probably be one of your delivery um uh, or post purchase teams if you're on sales it might be post sales teams uh, so it's really built around that team functionality around workflow usage and again this is about creating personalized content for each lead and customer look we actually do provide things like screencasting as well it's in there if you want to use it look it, video is a great medium regardless and personalization there's different levels <laughs> there's there's one-to-one which is amazing and if i mean this comes down to roi like not all leads are equal some are worth spending the time on others might not be um so like i think we'll be providing a, a, a swathe of personalization tools so that you can decide to invest different amounts of time into different types of users and leads uh, to convert as you like but really it's trying to work out for you where it makes sense to invest that time where the roi is beautiful beautiful okay so tell us about your personal origin story how do you fit into founding this product yeah, so like, like like all great ideas, as was born in the pub <laughs> here in Australia. So uh, we ran an agency. We ran a little startup agency. There, there were three of us here. And I'm from the UK originally. One of the guys was from New Zealand. One of the guys from Australia. And we ended up working through our networks with a bunch of clients in London, Paris, and New York, uh, which is great. And Australia is a great country to live in. But that meant that whenever we had inquiries coming in, we would always be asleep. Uh, we did not have a global team at the time. And so converting leads was a challenge. We would do the whole trip automation. Like we were one of like Intercom's like early, early customers. This is, this is you know, quite a few years ago. And in the early days that worked really well. As time went on, drip campaigns, email messaging started to become less and less effective. And yet we're quite an outgoing bunch of people. So we were very good at selling in person. We had a good offering and we were you know, very brand conscious and a you know, good agency, I think. Um, but it all came down to us in person. So we tried to break that mold in that we thought, look, how can we make that first impression with a client, even though we're asleep, how can we make it more personal, more us? And how can we convince them to take a demo with us? And so I would take a boat to work every day, as you do, uh, here in Sydney Harbour. And that boat would go past the Opera House, which most people in the world know what that is. So I would run up to the top of the ferry and we would ping a list of all our leads each evening into a Slack channel. I would get those, I would do a bit of research, and then I would record a video for each and every lead that came in. So if John Archer from Ogilvy in London signed up, I would do a bit of research on Ogilvy. I'd look at what his role was on LinkedIn. I found out what projects he worked on, what clients he had, and I'd be like, hey, John, I see you work on, on the Budweiser account. Just so happens we've also worked with Budweiser here in Australia, and this is what we've done. You know, obviously I'm on a boat uh, on the other side of the world, but I'm, uh, I'm going to be in London in the next kind of three weeks. Why don't I come in, bring coffees, and, you know, come pitch you and the whole team? Uh, and by the way, there's the Opera House. And John would get back when he woke up and be like, this is hilarious. <laughs> and it, it wasn't so much the pitch. He's just like, he's like, you guys, you guys are awesome. Like you have to come in. He's like hundred percent, like come on in. Like we'll, we'll, we'll buy the coffees. Don't worry. And so we go and get loads more meetings off the back of this, you know, great, great for us. Yeah. Like pass that back. It was just one of those probably, you know, the 50, the 50 hacks that we tried to get a better league conversion rate. I think we measured that we got three times the response rates of off any of the emails or drip automations that, that, that were going out, which is pretty good. So we use this. I went to, I, did, I remember doing a sales trip to the UK and I, in one of the meetings, one of the clients was like, oh, by the way, before you go, that video email boat thing, can we, uh, can we use that? And I was like, well, it's not, it's kind of an internal thing. And they're like, oh, please. And we're like, okay. So I come back and, my, and um. And my CTO, like we catch up for drinks afterwards. And I was like, hey, you know that um, you know that video thing? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, we should build that so people can use it. And he's like, <laughs> we should build that. Like, I love that he was like, can we use that? And you're like, you have no idea how manual it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not easy. And then I, and he looked at me and he's like, you can see him. And he's like, he's like, I effing knew you were going to ask me that. And he's like, ugh. He's like, you didn't realize we're actually already trying to run a company. I was like, yeah, I know. I was like, this is not what you're supposed to do, but like, I've got a good feeling here. And so we spent a couple of weekends in and we just hacked out something that that, that they could use. And it was, like, it looked awful. It worked. Like functionally, it worked. I had to like call off and like walk them through. I was like, look, this is not a real thing, but here you go. If you want to use it, this is what you need to do. And it was still a bit more manual. We didn't have apps. So they had to kind of record the videos like on, on desktop at the time. Um, we eventually got like a mobile upload system that was web only, but would only work if they were connected on on you know, decent Wi-Fi and stuff. And so we kind of hacked our way through it. They started using it. And then inevitably, like a week later, they're like, oh, by the way, two of our customers have also asked if they could use this. And we're like, 
get them on. And then we just put a pay, we, we put a paywall of like fifteen dollars. And then people kept signing up and paying, and we're like, "Hang, hang on a minute. I like, I like money." I, I was like, "This is, this is pretty cool." <laughs> hang on a minute. I like, I like money. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was honestly, it was a beer fund for the team. It was a bit of fun on the side, and it then took off and it overtook the agency in like twelve months. Oh my um, gosh! And the agency still runs, but it is by far the smaller business now. Uh, we were at the stage of like splitting those businesses out into separate entities and it just it just went and so i think you know a mix of seeing the right opportunity we understood like video as well because some of our agency stuff was was video research you know it was the right time i think people were kind of over the autom- like automated emails so i think it, it like the personalization was was people were were wanting it at the time it's obviously risen a lot since then it's become more and more of a thing video was starting to become a lot easier to access so i, I will say timing was right you know, it wasn't like it was just a, a fluke. I think we understood yeah. the industry. We had the early customers and we took the opportunity and went with it. We did not expect it to do what it did. Okay, so I love how often, I mean, you, you think about startups, you think about like how things began and, and how often you build something for yourself internally and someone says, can I, can I use that? Like, could I, like, it's almost like, can I get the recipe for that pie? Right, like I can, I can tell you, I think there are so many good businesses sitting with like internally, like 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 we we build other tools internally. Cause I'm like, we can't. How do we measure this? Then one's like, yeah, we can't do it. And I'm like, okay, let's build something that they can do that. And like half things we've built, I'm like, you do as all of these are like could be businesses because I'm pretty sure these are all issues. And like I've heard about a few other companies who've done it. It's it's not the most common thing because I th- I think there's amazing solutions that you know, especially I think think like like high volume companies like SaaS companies and software mm-hmm. companies solve internally because they have developments they can build stuff and i hear about these solutions i'm like that's awesome can we just um like how, how do we do that and so we always try and copy other methods and i'm like there are products within the things that people are building a lot of people either don't see the opportunity or most time they're just too busy like building two businesses at once is not the mm-hmm. best idea mm-hmm. um base camp do a good job of building multiple products like they just launched um their, their email system recently and things yep. so like it's hey yep yeah so it, it could be done uh, i think more companies should consider this and look at this uh, with us, like we are scaling personalization. And so I'm like, okay, right, guys, if you ever do stuff in, in the company that is personalized, if you ever hit a problem and it takes you months to solve it and then you figure it out, bring it up. Let's talk about, let's talk about that <laughs> because that could be a, a product that our clients are going to want to use as well. Yep. Um, it's that simple. It's so powerful. I mean, you think about the needs that are out there that are being unmet in the marketplace and, and what it means to, to build something when you can't find something else that's out there. I, so powerful. So powerful. So, so you really got the idea just by running into the problem of you needed your, your leads were not converting and you needed to find a different way to create conversions with those leads. So, it, I mean, it's, it's sheer. You were just trying to build something that would uh, raise conversion for your company. Yeah, like, I, I think like we, we the problem was probably exasperated for us because we had this unusual situation where we were based in Australia and selling into time zones that were 12 hours out of sync. So <laughs> we felt it more than anyone else well i was just gonna say that's a global problem the more the world becomes a global economy and we're selling to people who are all over i mean i have calls now every single week uh with people and and it's 10 o'clock my time 10 o'clock at night that i'm jumping on the phone and they're generally down in your neck of the woods it's 5 30 in the morning here <laughs> so i've exactly. got my coffee but it's normal it's like okay yeah. this is no day this is, this is what this is another day this is what we do yep absolutely i hear it okay so I'd love to point out some more moments where, you know, things where you, where you looked at it and said, okay, this software really needs this, like, like, like that, like the, the relationship status, so to speak from Mark Zuckerberg, if, you know, you've seen the social network where you sit back and the guy walks in and says, you know, Hey, do you know if Susie has a girlfriend or a boyfriend and, and, and oh, relationship status, you run over there and you, 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 you put that in there. Any moments like that where you realize, oh, we really need this feature. Yeah, so look, a lot of these came through us just because when when we first when we actually built it as a product, I guess then our, our minds started to shift towards okay, how do we productize this? But I'll be honest, because it was a hack on the side, we kept just trying to solve our own problem. So initially, we were like, let's make it better for us. Maybe other people would use this. So the first thing, the first penny, I guess, was um, we very quickly did OAuth sign up through I think Intercom and Mailchimp. Which are the two systems of systems that we used? So we built, you know, we did copy these Mailchimp. We're like, right, look, this, like, we're like putting CSVs into this is not good. 
how do we automate the menu? Like, we, like, we do this Slack, we do, and then I'm like, well, why don't we just, so why don't we just ping on, on, like, in, in, Intercom in? And I think it was, like, the week we talked about doing that, Intercom released their OAuth. So I think we were, like, the second. Integration. I might be wrong here. I think we were, like, the second company to ever use Intercom OAuth. Um, and we were a little tiny startup in the middle of, like, nowhere. So I don't even know if they even knew. I think we probably did hit them up about it, yeah? So basically, you could sign up to us using Intercom. And turns out we have some people come in. They're like, oh, this is great. So basically, when they signed up, just automatically, their leads started populating in. And we did, it did one thing. It just did leads, yeah? So did any sign up. So if you signed up and you were coming to have like 1,000 leads a day, you get like 1,000 just coming in, which is, which is too many to do. So, you know, we've obviously worked beyond that. But we did that. And then the same with MailChimp. You know, we've changed it around a little bit since then. We, we now let you sign up and then decide what you want to add because that, that spectrum has grown. But at the time, we did that. And then, again, we had like we had SaaS companies coming in. Like We had like Basecamp. We had like Firefox. We had like convert coming on board um and then basically and because of this this reason and they're like oh this this works and it, and it was a kind of an eye-opening moment because i think what had always been missing essentially in the way that we do it yeah and again this is very different to you know the looms and thing um because we were solving a very specific problem which was around leads is the missing bit was like oh look every morning i come in and there's my list of people and you pull the information about them as well so when I'm, when i want to personalize it I can see who the person is, what they've done. I can see what, what they've done in my onboarding process so I can tell them what they've missed. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of like, so it's not just saying, hello, welcome board. It's actually trying to drive them to the next step. There's that value. Really, I, yeah, there's value, yeah. I love that. I mean, you're you're looking at it and saying, let, let's not just change the method of communication, but how can how can I create a situation where I can actually provide value to that customer? Yeah, it, it's exactly. And I think, I don't think we realize at the time but that's basically what the business would would become is this layer that sat on top of these systems. We were just trying to, again, solve a problem for us. So I think we were a bit, I don't know, we were selfish in the beginning. We were like, let's go deeper and solve it for us. Since then, I mean, again, all, it, was all about, it was all about leads for the agency. Now the most common use case in software is not leads, it's about activation. So it's actually mm-hmm. paid customers who are then not activating and then they're churning in three months. So how do we, how do we get in and stop that? So, so the use cases have changed a lot from what we used it for, but that integration piece again it was just timing like, i feel like everything we've done was just timing and probably a few pub trips <laughs> we're like hey what, what else is new here we go so so when you uh, i gotta ask so when did you decide the bear suit was a good idea i by the way love the bear suit i think it's i think it's super fun um what what made you decide to go that route yeah so we're looking at names when it when it became a thing i was like we should make okay this is a thing like let's take let's get in. I'm I'm kind of on the branding side of things, uh, being creative. So I don't remember who came up with the name. It wasn't me. I think it might have been one of our. I think one of our investors might have even come up with the name. Um, we were looking for like connotations around the words hello and welcome. So bonjour, bonjourno, bonjouro. Domain was available. Like <laughs> number one thing we could buy it. Um, and then we start looking at. I don't know. I can't, we were all just joking around. I think we had a, a mini team retreat at the time for the agency, and one of one of the team was. Like, I think we were like, what about a bear? I think I think our first logo ever was a bee. And we're like, no, that's, that doesn't really work. And then somebody was like, how about a bear? And then he Googled and he pulled a picture of a bear waving. And he was like, how about this guy? And we're like, that, that's it. So we just sent the picture of the bear waving to a real bear, like to my designer. And, and then it kind of got out of hand. And then we're like, well, let's, do, I don't know, like, let's get some bear suits. And then we started saying, sending bear suits to like to customers. When they hit some milestones, we started saying bear suits to customers' kids. We started sponsoring koalas for clients. We, you know, we, sp- we sponsored a bear in Russia. We started sending honey to people. And it just kind of went, it went out of hand, but people loved it because it was just, it was stupid. You know, it wasn't serious. And that and that's our brand, yeah. Like, it's very lighthearted. And so we've kind of doubled down that. But but that's ultimately us. That, that's, yeah, at the end of the day, it was me half awake on a boat waving at clients in the morning. <laughs> Not very seriously. That's That's... That's what's happened. It's just, what? I mean, it's it's it almost like Baloo the bear, right? Like they're kind of happy, go like that's awesome. That that's I love the the way that you've embodied that brand. Okay, so so a question here that kind of runs off our normal repertoire of questions. You embodied and 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 in your bio, you talk about how you want to be one of the most loved brands out there. What what do you do? So 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 how many how many in the company now? Uh, so we're thirteen. No. Thirteen. Okay. And and it, it and is that the same 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 number of people who were there 
uh, at the beginning when you had the agency, or was it just like four or five in the agency to begin with? There was three of us to start with in the agency. So it was, three it was of you, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So as the team begins to grow like this, obviously, you know, the more people you get in there, the more opportunities there are for that lighthearted, fun piece of that to get lost. What are you doing? What what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs to make sure that that culture doesn't get lost? Ah, uh, so it's all down to hiring. I think uh, like two things. Yeah. So first of all, work out what your values are, and I don't mean get a consultant in and waff around a big whiteboard for four days and put up some things on your website and then forget about them. Um, it shouldn't take that long. Basically, just like work out the few things that are important to you, to your team. I like forget the company. Like what's important to the team, um, and don't don't lie to yourself. It's probably the number one piece of advice here. So if your culture is a hardcore sales culture whereby if people are not brutal, they won't survive, that's absolutely fine. Put that down, yeah? If 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 ultimately egos are part of your culture, that's also okay. If that's the thing that works for you, do that, yeah? Like, you know, you don't, it's, when people, people think what's a good culture, they always think it's about being fluffy and dancing around. Yeah, that, that, it, it's the thing that works for your business and the thing that's unique to you. Um, you know, I think like, 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 like Google, take Google, yeah? Like you always know somebody who works at Google, because they will tell you within about three minutes of meeting you, yeah? It's like Iron Man, the same thing. You're like, those are your system cultures. So if you want to build that, go build that. Um, with us, it's very relaxed. We've always done team retreats from day one. Um, we've had the whole bear suit thing. Anyone who joins the company gets to design their own bear suit. When we interview, we 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 tend to pick people based on that as well, like skill level, yes, but also are they kind of, ex- are they eccentric? We're a little bit weird. Everyone's got weird hobbies. Would they be the kind of people we would sit down and, you know, have a beer or have a cup of tea with? If we went away on a, on, like for a week together on a holiday, would we all have a ball or would it feel like a work holiday? If it felt like a work holiday, they're probably not right for us. Um, so we've always had a very friendship based the culture, which, which can be challenging. I, I, I wouldn't say every company should do this. You know, it makes the hard conversations really, really hard, um, but it makes the good times really good. So high on culture, have specific questions around that. You know, with us, if they don't pass the, the first, the first interview is generally not about skills. It's us it's sussing out. Culture. We think they'll fit with us. Yeah, like are, are they fun? Are they extremely hardworking? Like are they are they yeah. like above level of smart that culture? Yeah, oh, yeah. We we do something similar at data automation. We call it a nerd test, and uh, we're looking for individuals who are excited about stuff that's nerdy. Um, you know, looking looking for things like that. And the way that I pass my nerd test. Uh, I was gonna. I was gonna ask about that. I've seen that so, the whole. So many of you can't. You no. But you're listening to this. So you can't see it. But I just pulled. I'm on video here with uh, with our good friend Matt, and um, I just pulled out my sword. Um, this is in Glamdring. Or excuse me, Glamdring. In Glamdring means I am Fohammer in Elvish. Um, I did look that up, and that is my gamer tag. So if you ever see N Glamdring, oh, if you steal my gamer tag on any any platforms, we'll be in trouble. I'll be I'll, I'll be upset. But. Um, this is my sword. This is uh, Gandalf's sword from Lord of the Rings. And this is how I pass my nerd test. And so, so I ask people when we jump on those calls and, and my, um, my assistant who does our, our initial interviews with people, that's, what she, that's one of the things she asked. She said, okay, well, one of the things you need to do is you need to pass a nerd test. What do you do um, or, or what do you feel like that's nerdy? And um, it's been really powerful to find people who are eclectic and interested in that sort of thing. So, so that's my that's my nerd test. Is I, I have a sword that's literally within like arm's reach of my desk, um, j- just off camera. So pretty fun stuff. And, and I totally I agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more about bringing people in who who exonerate or or bring that culture to the table. Sure. All right. How did you keep so so shifting back to our 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 agenda here? How did you keep your as my sword you know reaches out from the background and almost hits me in the back of the head um how did you keep your family afloat while you got things started i mean obviously you had the agency but it's an agency of three people and it you know things are beginning to work but there's a possibility of you losing focus like how did you make sure that you didn't lose so much focus on what was working that you'd risk everything well we kind of did risk everything <laughs> i mean that's the thing you're like but you say you risk everything. Look, at the end of the day, you didn't have that much to lose yet. I mean, the agency was going well. We had a bunch of clients. We were setting up like a UK entity as well because it was going well. So I think, would we have risked that? Yeah, that you have a period where you lose the key man. Um, but we had a team in place. And so me and my, so me and my CTO actually ended up step, stepping out and building the new product. 
And so we had to hire another developer to, to take care of the existing one. So we put a few hires in. It was it was definitely a a split of focus, which I wouldn't suggest doing unless you know you need to. I wouldn't mm. say it was a pivot. We actually like ran the two companies alongside each other. Mm-hmm. Um, we took the risk. We felt the opportunity was big enough that it was worth doing. Um, and we had obviously, so we had indicators here. This was not a shot in the dark. Like mm-hmm. we kind of got a feeling. We kind of knew the space. We knew what we were after. Um, we then did end up raising funds. Um, and originally that though that those funds were purely for hiring. So we don't spend anything on marketing. We don't spend we don't, we're like a very lean operation. So th- those funds we raised basically got the team hired, got us built, and got us to break even. Um, and then through that, so that was our goal always is to be kind of self-sufficient. We raised enough to get us through that. Um, so look, there's always going to be risks. You start any company, there'll be risks. Um, there's risks now, like at the end of the day, you know, so it, it, it's a piece of advice. I think if you're in this space and my dad ran a pretty big company, so he ran the biggest archery company in the world, uh, okay. which is still now, so those who know, who know the name Barnett in the States, um, oh, yeah. if you've ever. Yeah, so bows, crossbows, they run that now. My brother runs it in the States. But the, he, I remember talking to him in the early days, and I was like, this is pretty stressful. You know, like, at the end of the day, if we don't get to break even, like, you know, we, we, we all lose. And he's like, enjoy it. He's like, these are the easy days. He's like, when you have 500 people working for you, he's like, then it's stressful. Because then if you mess up, you've got a lot more jobs in the line that you're responsible for. Um, so I think, yeah, the point is, and you find this, as you grow, those goalposts always, always move. You know, you get to your first 100,000, you're like, amazing. And then, but then you get there and you're like, oh, we need to get to 200,000. You get to 200,000, you're like, oh, we need to get to a million. You get to a million, you're like, oh, we need to get to 10 million. You get to 10 million, you're like, oh, we need to get to 100 million. So those bulk goal, goal posts always keep moving. You're always pushing yourself. You'll always have to take risks, I think, if you want to if you want to be really successful. There are very few companies that don't take risks and make it the whole way. Um, there's, there's a period when you can corporatize and you can do risk and you can relax. I don't think that most of us ever get there, to be honest. Yeah. So, you know. You guys will be doing it right now, like dead automation, like the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. it's 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 a it's a continual process of growing, understanding where the goalpost is, and being okay with that risk and mitigating it as much as you can, right? As you as you see where does it go? That's beautiful. So, what um, difficulties did you did you face as you big? began to start the company and and how did you overcome them what would you say some of those key difficulties were so for us yeah so like the early days were a balance of losing a kind of couple of key men for an opportunity that we hadn't completely proven out and obviously communicating that amongst the team um, and then going out and communicating that to um, potential investors as well Uh, it's a challenge it's absolutely one that you can overcome i think beyond that hiring in the early days i don't think we understood culture enough at the beginning I think we thought we did and we didn't and we made a few wrong hires. They were just the wrong hires for, for the company. Um, so you go through those growing pains. If you've got more cognizant of it, we'll probably make some wrong hires again. I mean, it's, it's very hard to get your head around. And when you're younger and you want to hire people two months ago and you're looking for that role, because you always highlight, um, which, you know, I, I don't think you can get around because you're always limited by, by, by resources. And by the time you have the resources, a person's in dire need. You know, like you do tend to hire fast. We, we're trying to slow down the process now to make better hires, um, but it's difficult because you've always got a fire going. Um, so I think, I think culture, I think that's um, product, not so much of a challenge because we've kind of grown quite organically there. Like that's actually been okay. Like now we're looking at how we, you know, like move the business from being, you know, tools in, 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 into a platform. Like how do we double down on the whole idea of personalization? Uh, and there's a space that's really exciting. It's a much bigger move for the company. So I'm sure we'll go through some growing pains doing this as well. So again, if you take, you know, your company from what it potentially can do and look at how, how do you 10 or 100 exit, it, it's it's a big shift in terms of messaging, in terms of positioning, which I think is going to be a massive challenge to say the least. So yeah. we've probably got some bigger challenges coming. I think we're probably at the period where, where, where we're going to have as many challenges now as we did in the early days. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think people, again, I think people, I think people's the hardest thing always. People finding finding the right person to to sit in that seat. I, as a as an entrepreneur, I've discovered that making the wrong hire. They 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 said somewhere, and I forget you know who it was exactly that said this, but you lose about half of what a person's yearly salary is in turnover. So like if you if you have a person that you're paying a hundred thousand dollars a year, you lose them it's, you know, $50,000 down the drain in trying to replace and bring on someone new. So yeah, I had, a, so I had a friend who ran quite a big sales organization and he was like, sales guys are coming with us, you know, they get six weeks and then, you know, if they don't perform, we turn over. And he's like, you know, we turn over like two out of three of them. 
And I was like, he's like, yeah, because we're really good, really efficient. We turn, we turn over two or three of them. And I was like, maybe, flip it on his head, maybe you're just not very good at hiring. <laughs> like, I was like, it's not, I was like, I, I understand the sentiment of rolling them fast and that's good, but you should not be doing that as the usual basis. I'm like, you're not, you need to improve your hiring process because you should be keeping, you know, two out of three of them minimum. Um, well, so, yeah. Well, and, and I think it's different for sales too, right? Because sales can be a little tricky. That, that, that software sales role or just sales role in general, man, those guys are hard to hold on to. But, but I hear you. Like, I'm, I'm right with you on, like, do your absolute best to hold on to people as long as you can um, and be respectful of their opportunities and, and everything that's there. Yeah. So n- next question here. When was it? What year did uh, did you get started? Was it was it you know are you two years old, three years old? How long ago? Two thousand seventeen. Two thousand seventeen. So three, okay, so three and a half. Started. Three three and a half years. Okay, perfect. And when you compare three and a half years ago to now, obviously it started with just two of you who kind of stepped away from that other business to to build something new. You know, how has it changed? What what what's been what, some of the biggest differences between how it was then and what it is now? Process. Number one, we have a process now. <laughs> we have more, and our process. So, excuse me, <clears throat> our processes are still are still not there. They will, I'm assuming, never be there. Process around product development, around how we build stuff, around prioritization. Process around operations, uh, around customer success, around marketing. You know, I mean, I mean, this is normal again. Yeah, when you first start, you just wing it, and then as you start to build, especially as you, as you start to turn from a flat organization and start to get a bit of hierarchy, which, which will happen. Um, I think hierarchy actually is important. I don't think you can be totally flat uh, because I think people need leadership, like absolutely. And when you first start, you're probably, you probably have more senior team members who are going to hopefully be the leaders if they can grow. Um, I think you need to start to put process in place so that you can handle and run bigger teams and bigger operations because without process, there comes a point when you just break and you cannot run them. It all comes down to that. And I hate that because as a creative, I'm I'm very anti-process, but could not survive without it yeah like everything has to be a part of that and it's fine if you don't like it just get over yourself <laughs> yeah no i'm i'm with you i'm i'm more of a creative as well and i have a really hard time adopting and maintaining some of those processes i think honestly you know if you look at the e myth and, and a lot of these other books that are out there that talk about starting a business and and why they fail i think a lot of the time it's because some of the people who jump in there are more of the creatives and so they have such a hard time being like, I don't want to follow a process. I hated it when I worked for so-and-so and he had a process that I had to follow. So I'm just not going to have a process. And then they never really learn that that's how you scale, right? You you have to define that process. That's, so the, the, the name of this podcast, Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, it's all about creating a process that, that can then be either handed to another person or you look at the process and like, oh, I don't need to do this anymore or I can automate it, right? So couldn't agree with you more that that process is so key to 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 what's there so here's a question for you from one creative to another what do you do to make it so the process can remain fun and interesting because i mean you sound like you hire a lot of creatives like people who are creative enthusiastic interested in 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 that sort of vibe or, or culture what do you do to keep those guys interested even though it's very process oriented now but i think process is the but so it all comes down to results if, if, if you get the process right and they follow it and the results end up being fantastic and you celebrate that, that's it. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, cool, that worked. I think, look, it, continuing improvement, yeah? So you, you, you need to, keep, like, look at us now compared to where we were before. I'm like, we are a different fundamental company. We are more successful at what we do. We take better punts. We understand the data more. So we understand the successes and we look at that, we celebrate them, and, and that, that d- does it for us, yeah? So, like, it, Here's the thing, like as a creative, what you learn is that like solving anything is 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 fun. Solving process is fun ultimately because you're you're hitting a challenge, you're finding your way through, you're coming out of it much better, and that opens up the next set of challenges that you then go on to. So it all builds, you know, things that we used to find three years ago and now we do in our sleep. So the process itself is interesting, it is good, you know. The challenge is how do you make what works today work for, you know, like imagine, just imagine doubling your team each time. Like you don't need to build process around, you know, 10, like I don't, I don't need to build, build a process for 100 people. I just need to build it for 20. And when we figure that out, we'll be good for a while. And then when we hit 20, we'll need to figure it out for 40 people. And then we'll need to figure it out for 100. Um, we just need to stay one step ahead. Don't be a one person team and build a process for a 10 person company. Mm-hmm. Okay, build it for, for a two per, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like do it at your own scale. 
enjoy enjoy it for the sake of enjoying it. Enjoy it for the problem solving that it is. Like that's a creative mm-hmm. attitude. And you know, as a creative, number one thing, don't be too precious. Like if it's not if it's ninety percent there, move on. Like forget the last ten percent if you're building a business. If you're building it, if you if you if you're doing a piece of artwork or sculpt or, or you're sculpting something, the last ten percent is really important. Yeah, and and it, and it will take as long as the first ninety percent in a business. I I would suggest it's the opposite. You just need to drop it and keep going. Yep. I, so so huge word of advice for those listeners who find themselves being creative and find themselves getting excited about turning that wheel once or twice or even three times, but then they get bored. Remember that there's another wheel that turns the entire wheel. So you may have figured out how to turn one gear inside the business, but designing that entire process, stepping back and recognizing that it's time to work on the business and the problems that come with that, that can be creative work as well. So huge takeaway there. I, I really appreciate that, Matt. All right. So, so uh, final question here. What advice would you give to other SaaS entrepreneurs that are just starting out or just entrepreneurs in general? Enjoy the journey. I think it's probably the number one. It's not about a destination. Like this is not a destination uh, project. Uh, building a successful SaaS company will take you years to do. Don't be swayed by the build it in two years and sell mentality because it is not the norm. I think the average the average company sells between seven and 10 years old. And the average age of a founder is, I think, 42 when the company sells, not 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you if you truly understand that, then be okay with it taking time. Um, enjoy the journey. Enjoy building the process. Enjoy building the team. You know, that's where you should take your enjoyment from because that's what gets you out of bed every day. Um, do that and you'll have a wonderful time. And then if you do sell, you know, great. Go go build the next one. You know, go go cool. do something good. Yep. You know, but but enjoy the process on that. Yeah, you know, enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Well, you heard it here, um, ladies and gentlemen. This honestly, super excited to go back myself and listen to some of the nuggets here and and, and the wisdom that was shared by Matt Barnett. This, this is automate, delegate, eliminate, and honestly, couldn't thank you enough, Matt, for joining us today. No problem, Will. Awesome to be here. All right, thanks everybody. That's automate, delegate, eliminate, and we will see you on our next couple of episodes as we. Uh, begin to talk to more uh, SaaS founders, uh, the likes of Zapier and many others. So excited to, to continue our season. You've been listening to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, hosted by Paul Christensen.